We are so excited to be here with you guys. Uh, we were just here a couple of weeks ago for the ARM conference and, uh, and just love, love this house. There's um, it's a lot of places we can go in the United States and a lot of invitations we, we receive, but we prioritize places we feel like the Lord says, go there, connect with these people. And uh, we met Caleb and Marley some years ago and, and, uh, uh, and, and I don't know, God just kind of knit our hearts together with them and, and we're, we're just honored to, to give our voice to whatever it is that the Lord's saying and doing in, in this house. And, and every time I get up to preach and minister, it's a tremendous honor, but I feel like, like uh, when I come here, there's, there's something unique that's, that's released that actually uh, I get to carry around the nation in many cases. I preached a message here maybe like two years ago that um, preached here first and then ended up going all over the nation and uh, bless many people. So there's a wellspring of revelation in here, and it really has a lot to do with what you put a demand on, okay? What I preach, you say, are you saying that what you preach depends on me? In large part, yes. It's true. <clears throat> Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, goes to his hometown in Mark chapter five, and when he walks into his hometown, to minister as he had in many other places, miracles, healing, signs, and wonders. I mean, he's God who can hinder him, right? But he walks into his hometown, and when he gets there, he's encountered with unbelief. Who does this guy think he is? <laughs> he's no better than the rest of us. What, what's the deal with this guy? They become intellectually offended at him, and you would think that, of course, God can break through anything. God can do anything. But it's interesting how God takes the most powerful force in the universe, which is his word, and then he subjects it to whether or not the hearts of people are bent towards belief or unbelief. He actually gives you the chance, the freedom, the grace, you could say, to oppose his word and walk away completely unaffected by the most powerful force in the universe. So the Bible literally says in Mark chapter six that Jesus comes into his hometown and he could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief, which makes it sound like we are more powerful than God. It's not what it means. It means that you and I have been given a measure of responsibility to receive the word with either faith or unbelief. Every time you come into church, you either carry faith or unbelief. Now listen, it's dangerous to go to church in unbelief unless you're willing for it to be broken off. Because what unbelief will do is it will actually warp the word of God coming to you to the point where you'll actually build increasing justifications for an increasing unbelief. Which is why there's a lot of people who can sit in church for decades and become increasingly hard-hearted. <laughs> so I like to confront unbelief every time I preach. It's just super fun for me. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean I like to go to houses that are filled with unbelief. I, I, I like to come to places like this because there's faith in the room. When the word of God is read, pre preached, proclaimed, and declared, faith arises in the room. You can feel it. Uh, you can hear it in the worship. You can hear it as, as, as people just release a voice, sound into the atmosphere. That, that healing is present in the room. That uh, say, well, well, did healing show up and it wasn't here before? No, it's always been here. I always find it funny when we, we have Pentecost Sunday every year. Pentecost Sunday, that's when the Holy Spirit's gonna come back. He only shows up one day a year, like Christmas. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter two, and he's never left. You have access to everything in God that you will ever need, everything. He's given us, the Bible says, everything pertaining to life and godliness. The Bible says he's given you the Holy Spirit without measure. The Holy Spirit knows everything. You know, you know everything? Your spirit knows everything. Your spirit is healed. Your spirit is renewed. What we're learning how to do is to tap into, in our soul and our body, the life-giving power of, of what has happened in the regenerating salvation, Holy Spirit-infused nuclear dynamo of heaven's sound reverberating through the new creation that is your spirit. And that's how, listen, once we tap into that and we let the spirit take charge and we are spirit-filled, spirit-led, Holy Spirit-guided people, then our body becomes a recipient of the life-giving power that 
that's happening within our spirit. Sometimes the body, in moments like this, as we begin to talk about the things of the spirit and unpack the new covenant, the body can get healed and you don't even know that it happened until you suddenly realize, wait a minute, where'd the pain go? Where'd the tumor go? Where'd this go? I, I, I came in with it. I, it fell off somewhere. I'm not 100% sure what happened, but I think I got healed. What happened? You gave your spirit the chance to be in charge and the body and the soul just line up. That's the way this thing works. When you come into the house of God, whether it's in worship or whether it's in the preaching of the word, or even just, wow, what a, what a radical idea just to read the Bible in church. Even in, in, in just those moments, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> In those moments, you suddenly start to go, oh my goodness, you know, I, I'm turning, what am I doing? I'm turning my attention toward the things of the Spirit. And whatever has your attention has your affection. Paul said in Colossians 3, set your mind, your affection, your heart on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? Because there's life when you turn your affection toward the Lord. We love him because he first loved us. So how do we turn our affection toward the Lord? By first getting a revelation of how loved we are by the Lord. When you realize that he loves you before you did anything to impress him or disappoint him, when you realize that his affection and his heart is for you, even while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. You know, he didn't wait for you to get your act together before he decided to save you by his grace. He looked at a humanity that was completely in opposition to him, and he loved him so much he laid down his life, and he's still doing it today for you and I. Is he still hanging on the cross? No, but the resurrection power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available within reach and dwells within you as you do the one thing that the devil has never done. Not just believe, because the devil believes in Jesus. The devil believes in God, so what? I believe in Jesus, so what? Even the devil does that. What the devil has never done is surrendered his life to the Lord. This is what you have a chance to do every time you come into the house of God, every time you just turn your heart toward the Lord and say, God, I just live in reconciled rest and complete union from, from a revelation of surrender to you. You are the Lord of my life. So you can believe in Jesus. You can believe in the grace and the cross of Christ. But the question is, how surrendered to the Holy Spirit are you willing to be? I'm not even preaching yet. I'm just rambling at you. I like rambling at you. I just talk to myself here. I talk myself happy before I get into this message. <laughs> My dad was part of the holiness movement. He said they only lack two things, holiness and movement. But <clears throat> and then he got into the faith movement, word of faith movement, and he said, man, these guys had all the power, no holiness. The holiness folks, man, they, they, they were focused on being holy by discipline. They had no power. The faith mo movement was focused on letting the power of God flow through you by faith. They had no holiness. And he's like, man, it'd be great if we could just take the best of all these worlds and throw them together. And, uh, and it's true. In the new covenant, you and I have access to all the power of God. But we do that by surrendering to the Holy Spirit of God. And can I just say this, that, that the Holy, Holy Spirit is kind of a big deal. My dad had an aversion to uh, people saying, well, I'm filled with the Spirit. And he said, kind of interesting how people talk about being filled with the Spirit. He said, but it's like, it's like receiving the Spirit but rejecting the Holy. And if, <laughs> if you receive the Spirit and reject the Holy, you might want to check what Spirit you got. Okay? Because there's something about the Holy Spirit that comes in and converts and transforms and actually changes us from the inside out. And pretty soon, the things that you used to struggle with, you just don't even want to do anymore. Why? Because you're so enamored with the love of the Father. Uh, that where you were trying to find pleasure and satisfaction and all that from other places, we call that places in the world, suddenly they have no appeal to you. You begin to realize that's, that, that's, that's not actually a counterfeit to something that's authentic. And, uh, oh my goodness. So, yeah, you know, if, you don't, if you're not saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll get you, we'll get you covered this morning. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Got a few things I want to mention to you. Um, we, we've had this stuff before, so many of you have already picked these things up. I just mentioned to you. How many of you never heard me preach anything before? You've, like, never heard me talk about it? Okay, a few of you. Good. Uh, so we have a number of USB thumb drives in the back. They have tons of teaching on them. And uh, this one's 24 hours of teaching on identity. I like to say it like this. God told the prophet Jeremiah, I knew you before I even formed you. So you could be known 
before you knew you could be known. So here's the question. What did he know? What has he always known about you? Because what he has always known about you from before you even got here, that is the truth of who you really are. So you have one assignment in this life, and that is to find out what God believes about you and agree with that, which means letting go of all the lies and labels that you've believed about yourself, which is called unlearning. It actually can be a lot of fun if you're willing to be a student. All right, heads up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's see. Um, There's a number back there. There's one on spiritual joy fair, not warfare, joy fair, have more fun, get more done. It's one called Restoring Revelation. It's the book of Revelation from a new covenant perspective. Promise it'll make Revelation the happiest book you've ever read in your entire life. It'll blow your mind with all kinds of goodness. There's a 10-part study on Daniel back there. There's a whole bunch of, and we've got some new stuff online. If, if you've got all the USBs that we've got, we've got some new stuff that we just released this week. There's a seven-part series on the New Covenant that's available on the website, billvanderbush.com, and a teaching on heaven that's two and a half hours long, and ah, there's all kinds of good stuff. Um, there's a book back there called Reckless Grace. It's on a really bizarre verse in John 20, verse 23, where Jesus says, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. It matter if you, just imagine this. With, does it matter if the grace you give away actually works? <laughs> yeah, it should. Because we're actually called to release the grace that we have received. Freely you've received, freely give. You're not the source of grace, God's the source. But he lives in you, that makes you the resource. He's the source, you are the resource. Turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm a resource. See, so you didn't know, did you? Heads up. woo this one, I'm gonna, last one I'll mention here, it's called Soul Reformation. I think this might be my favorite resource in the back and I didn't even write it. It's a book that Tracy uh, wrote and we're actually gonna take some time and record this in an audio book this week here. Uh, uh, it just, this book uh, is a prayer. The whole book is a prayer. And it came after Tracy had had, a, she'd been in a pretty bad car accident. I was actually preaching in Boston and uh, it was a kingdom conference, righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And I was preaching, the night I was talking about peace was the theme of the night. Five minutes before I'm getting up to speak, I get this cryptic text, in bad accident, car rolled over. And I'm picturing, from my wife, right? I'm picturing her like laying there where only her thumb works, right? And she's like, this is all I can, t-. And that's like my, and they're about to introduce me to preach on peace at a kingdom conference and my wife's just been in a rollover. So I'm like, what is going on? I mean, you just feel like everything just goes cold. You're like, Phew. You're like suddenly you just the adrenaline and everything and you're like and totally helpless. What can I do? I'm you know thousand mile, thousand miles away, and uh, and all of a sudden this peace just flooded over me. You know it's like when you have nothing else that you can do, you just kind of come to the moment you're sitting in. And in that moment, right in the now, there is so much righteousness, peace, and joy available to you right now. Crazy. No matter what tragedy you're facing. Um, anyway, turns out that she was, uh, she was alive and well, sort of, uh, she had, she did have a chronic pain condition from that accident that, uh, was debilitating for, for the most part, uh, for a while. And one day she just kind of got tired of it, just got fed up and said, I, I need to, I need to have language to speak over myself. Listen, <clears throat> We beg God to come and heal us. God has placed everything in you necessary to see any miracle happen, invade any possibility. You will never encounter any difficulty that you don't have within you because the Spirit of God is in you. You will never encounter any difficulty, sickness, sin, disease that you don't have the ability to see overcome because of what's already been placed within you. Learning to tap into that, learning to rest in that, learning to release and appropriate that, that, that's that's a gift, that's one of the reasons why we study and learn. And so what Tracy did is she goes, I need words. I need need to learn how to declare some things over myself, speak to myself. Faith, by the way, comes from what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? How about this? 
<clears throat> faith comes from hearing yourself speak the word of God. Don't wait for somebody else to come speak it over you. You got a mouth and you've got ears. You can actually preach to yourself. It's totally legal to prophesy to yourself. <laughs> David, one day, <laughs> David was living in an old covenant world, but he had carried a new covenant spirit. And one day David goes, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. What does he do? He sees himself as depressed and messed up. A lot of bad circumstances going on. What does David do? He steps out of himself and looks at himself and gives himself a good talking to. Some of you need to give yourselves a good talking to. <laughs> Why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. Sometimes he was encouraging talking to. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We say, oh, thanks, David, for that encouraging word. You understand? He was talking to himself. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. David, who forgives all of your iniquities. David had a few. And who heals all of your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction, David. He crowns you with love. What is he doing? He's preaching to himself. We hear it, and we just take it for us. Totally legal to preach to yourself. So Tracy prayed and preached herself well, which is pretty cool. I just love that. All right. All of those would be great messages if I would only preach them right now, but I'm not going to. We're going to talk about something else entirely. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. I want to take you on a bit of a journey today and uh, <clears throat> preach about something. I, I, I just talked about it on a, on a podcast a week ago because it was stirring in my heart because of... Um, when I knew I was coming here and I told Kayla, I said, I got a word that's stirring in my heart that I... I I've never actually preached publicly before, and I haven't, not until today, um, just on a podcast, and I was just kind of kicking the tires on this thing, and I liked it so much, I decided I'll just bring it here. Problem is, is it's about four hours long, so I'm, I'm kidding, it's not, really not. <laughs> it's not. <clears throat> um, I love the new covenant, Okay. Uh, it's not a fringe doctrine. It, it, I really am, am so given over to this idea as I travel around the United States that so much of the body of Christ does not understand the new covenant. It's like we've received new covenant salvation by grace through faith, but many people live an old covenant relationship with God where at any moment you're expecting that God's gonna drop the hammer on us. And it reflects, not just in our life of kind of keeping God at arm's length, but it reflects in our sermons. It reflects in, in prophets who get up and, and basically tell us that God's about to drop, drop judgment on our nation or the church or whatever. And you know, while God can do it, he can do whatever he wants, he would have to violate the new covenant to do that. And here's, here's the reason why. <clears throat> Jesus Christ took all of the judgment on the cross once for all, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There's no more judgment. There is correction from the Holy Spirit. There's no more punitive judgment that is left. Why? Because Jesus dealt with it once and for all. You gotta understand what Christ did, what he ended on the cross and what he inaugurated is a brand new covenant. Let me ask you this question. In the last 2,000 years, since the resurrection of Christ, has God dropped the hammer of judgment on a nation or on the church in a way where collective we, collectively we knew exactly what was going on. We had prophetic words. We, when it happened, we all knew it because that's how it happened in the Old Testament. In the Old Covenant, the nature of the relationship between God and man was all about sowing and reaping. You do good, you get blessed. You do bad, you get cursed. It's just the way it is. And every time Israel sinned and violated the covenant, God would send a prophetic voice to them and say, this is what you did, and this is what's going to happen unless you repent. Typically, they wouldn't repent. Then the judgment would come. They'd all go, oh, God was serious. Then they would repent and turn back to God. But they all collectively knew that it was happening. Nobody had to guess. 
on the last 2,000 years, since the resurrection, we have not had God drop the hammer of judgment on a nation or the church like he did in the old covenant. Why? Because we are in a new covenant world. And yet, when I hear prophets get up and go, judgment's coming, I'm like, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I mean, I want to be nice about it, but I'm saying, stop telling people that we're still under an old covenant. You got to know what the new covenant did. I put out a poll a while back and said, you know, has, has God dropped the hammer of judgment on the church in the last 2,000 years? Yes, no, I don't know. Then people could add a response underneath of it all. And most people said no, or I don't know, a few people said yes. Somebody added the response underneath, no, but he probably should. And beyond that, people like voted on it. Like, yeah, that's what I want to see. And I begin to realize this is the deal. We look at the world and we see sin and darkness and evil, and it does exist. But the Bible says that Jesus took care of the sin problem once and for all on the cross. So I don't think the world has a sin problem. I think it has an identity problem. In other words, we don't know who we are because of what he's done, so we walk in a false identity, and then we act that out, resulting in evil and sin. So it's almost like we are reintroducing back into the world an evil that Jesus dealt with on the cross and continues to deal with by his grace. So here's the way it kind of works. God will actually confront you individually. Say, well, God doesn't correct anymore? Oh, he definitely corrects. But this is not the correction of like a king to a peasant. This is correction like a father to a son. Hebrews 12 says, and I'm going to read this in a little while. It says, who he loves, he chastens. And he scourges every son who comes to him. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. The word for chastening there is the word correction. Don't despise the correction of the Lord. Because if he doesn't correct you, are you even his child? So the ability to actually let the Holy Spirit come in and shift direction when you're going in a direction and God says that's going to be destructive for you and it's going to bring destruction to other people's lives. And so by his Holy Spirit, he brings correction to you. When he does that, is that punishment? No, that's love. And it validates our sonship. He's a really, really good dad. And so what does he do? He individually, by his Spirit, shifts our heart. And here's the beautiful thing about it. It's not like it has to be like Israel as a whole rejected God, rejected the voice of God. They don't want to hear him anymore. Exodus chapter 20, verse 19. They say, Moses, we don't ever want to hear God speak again. You go talk to God and you come back and tell us what he says. Now God can't correct people individually. Why? Because they've shut off hearing his voice. So he has to actually turn the entire nation corporately. But under the law, when you violated it, you got punished. That was the warning. Jesus shuts that whole system down and inaugurates a new covenant. And he does it at the table of communion. Breaks the bread, pours the wine, says, this is the new covenant in my blood. My broken body, my spilled blood. This is a new covenant. Can I tell you this? That the table is the church. You and I. Church of the future, the church of the new reformation, the church of the new covenant is not a church of stadiums, it's a church of tables. Because you can hide in a stadium, you can't hide at a table. And anybody can just sneak into a crowd in a stadium, but you gotta be invited to a table. And you say, well, I only have people at my table that I like. And Psalm 23 says he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Because it's at the table of communion. Two things happen. Christ is revealed, and your enemy discovers he's your brother. Hearts are changed and transformed. Discipleship, vulnerability, intimacy happens at the table. Life is exchanged. Words of wisdom are exchanged. This issues come to the surface. There's a, an opportunity for conversation to happen. And we actually have a chance to be the body of Christ at the table of communion. Communion, by the way, it's, I, when he says do this in remembrance of me, we do it in church, and I like that we do it in church because it's really, really important to just always kind of come back to the, that point, that hinge point of history where everything changed and the new covenant was inaugurated. But, but the table happens every time you sit down. 
to a meal and acknowledge Christ. Every time. We got to get this mindset. I really feel like Bill Johnson had this beautiful message last Sunday. His wife passed away a week and a half ago, and three days later, he got up and spoke. And one of the most profound messages I've ever heard in my entire life, I think it's probably ever been preached. And at the end of it, he says, I believe there's a revival of communion that is coming to the earth. I about came out of my chair. What is he talking about? Revelation of the new covenant and the communion table. That doesn't mean to shut this down and just like put tables. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this is a moment where we, we come in and we, we get it. You understand what we're doing here in, in, in church. I think I mentioned this at the conference, but I got to get to this sermon. I really do. <clears throat> what we're doing here in this moment, this is, this is school, right? You, let me explain. So what's, people will deconstruct now and they'll like completely leave and walk away from God and they'll walk away from church. A lot of times, first off, it, it goes, well, I don't even want to be a part of this system anymore. This doesn't seem very New Testament to me. No, this is really important. Let me tell you why. This is school. This is a point of instruction, more patterned after the synagogue. And, and here's the way it works. Let's say it like this. You come into this church gathering, this weekly gathering, and you go, uh, what do I do? Well, sign up to be a greeter, learn how to be kind to the people of God, then take that spirit of kindness out into the world, right? Yeah. 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 Try that. Start there. You know, I want to learn how to be generous. Awesome. So you come in and you learn how to give and support the body of Christ that gathers here on a regular basis, and that becomes a regular routine for you. It starts out as obedience, but all of a sudden, you talk about like, a, like in Corinthians, it says, let each man purpose in his heart. What it happens? Your heart turns from just mere obedience to radical generosity. Then what do you do with that heart of generosity? You go and take it out into the world. My friend Jim says, people say, well, money can't buy happiness. The only people who say that haven't given enough of it away. Why? Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's true. It's radically true. So what do you do? You learn how to be radically generous in the house by listening to the principles of the word of God. Then you take that generosity out into the world. You're standing at a gas pump and you decide to pay for somebody else's gas. You're in the, you're in a, uh, uh, you, you got a little extra money and you're, you're, in a, uh, you're down at the Cracker Barrel or something. You're like, you know what? I want to buy their, their meal. It's almost like you let the Holy Spirit just move through you to be radically generous in strange ways to people around you. This has caught on in our, in our hometown back in Celebration, Florida. I, I, you hardly go to a Starbucks without somebody ahead of you having paid for your coffee. And so what do you do? You just you pay for the coffee of the people that are coming up behind you. What do you what's happening? It's just sort of like chain of generosity. Everybody ends up spending money, but everybody gets blessed. Crazy how that works. It's like you walk away like, man, I'm super encouraged today. The world is filled with amazing people. I mean, it's like... What about like sitting in here and listening to somebody talk? You sit and listen to somebody just preach the word for an hour or so, and what does it do? It does two really important things in your heart. It actually turns you into a student in a world filled with noise. Outside of here, you may be one of those people who has to look at your phone every like 90 seconds, right? Once you come in here, now you're challenged to surrender to one of the most ancient forms of communication known to man. And that is somebody getting up and sharing something that's on their heart and you having a chance to learn how to be a listener. It also, second, puts you in the heart posture of being a student. Why is that important? Because you're going to be a student for eternity. Won't I know everything when I get to heaven? No. Where'd you get that idea? How do you know I won't know everything when I get to heaven? Because John, in Revelation, is standing in the throne room, about as close to heaven as you can get, and he knows nothing they have to stop the whole play like four times and explain to John what's going on because he's completely clueless. Tells me that you can literally be standing in heaven and go, I, I think I need to learn some stuff. I, I have no idea what's happening right now. So I'm, I seriously think it, for all of eternity, we're going to be learning, always learning, ever unfolding in knowledge. I think that's just the way it is. Anyhow. Take what you learn here in school, take it out into the world. 
All right, Second Chronicles chapter two. I want to talk to you about a, co- a, a new covenant, old covenant dynamic and difference. Because when I start talking new covenant, so much of the stuff that I talk about seems so good. It's it's almost like it's too good to be true, and and so people can start to look at their own ignorance, sin, unworthiness, and feel like I'm not worthy of the glory of the new covenant that you're talking about, Bill. That's going to be for the special, extra anointed people, right? Like Taylor. <clears throat> I don't know. I just pick on you because you have this like beaming, glowing, happy face that makes me go, whatever, whatever joy, you, whatever joy juice you're on, I want like a double shot of that. That's what I mean. It's like, I just love happy people. All right. So I want to just draw one contrast in this covenant and kind of help you understand what you have access to and why you have access to it. And we're going to do this in, in about 12 minutes. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 26. Uh, Second Chronicles 26, I'm just going to like hit this real quick. Uzziah, it's a story of a guy named King Uzziah. And in verse 3, it says Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Verse 4, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And, listen to this phrase, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. In verse 6, he goes to war with the Philippines, uh, Philistine, Philippines, <laughs> wow, maybe I needed a triple shot espresso. <laughs> if you're from the Philippines and you're watching online, grace to you, King Uzziah is not coming to go to war with you, okay. <clears throat> he went to war with the Philistines. <laughs> Some of you, that's all you're going to remember from this morning. (laughs) Some king went to war with the Philippines. Verse 7 says, God helped him against the Philistines. I love that phrase, God helped him. Look again in verse 4, God made him to prosper. In verse 7, God helped him. And so he goes on and reigns for 50 years, the next dozen or so verses talk about how good he did in the sight of the Lord. As a matter of fact, we have no record in that 50-year time that Uzziah ever violated a single law, a single commandment, a single ordinance of God. He, he becomes so uh, wealthy and powerful that he has 2,600 officers in his army and nearly 300,000 soldiers. Nations from around, from Egypt all the way up, they all have heard of this guy, and he makes Israel incredibly powerful. And in his 50th year of his reign, something happens. And this is where it gets especially interesting. Verse 16, when he was strong in his heart, he was lifted up in his heart to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord, his God, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar. Azariah the priest went in after him, 80 of the priests, valiant men, and withstood him and said, it's not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, you've trespassed, you'll have no honor from the Lord your God. I want you to see, this is where he goes wrong. It's not what he did, it's what he did with what he did said he became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the Lord in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. Verse 21 says Uzziah was a leper, King Uzziah was a leper until the days of his death. Dwelt in isolation, for he was a leper. He was cut off from the house of the Lord. Last two years of his life, Perhaps one of the most holy kings in the Bible dies a leper. It's an interesting story to me. You say, wow, this doesn't sound like God's being very good. You understand, when you live under a covenant, God's not ambiguous about the terms of engagement here. Under the old covenant, there were rules you could not break and lines you could not cross. Prior to the Old Covenant, things were different. Uh, The Old Covenant started in Exodus chapter 19, when Israel comes out of Egypt, 
and comes to Mount Sinai, and God gives them terms of engagement. They reject the first set of terms to be kings and priests unto God. They reject his voice, and so the backup plan is called a kinship covenant. It's a fascinating and brutal way of having a relationship. It's like, it's like getting a lawyer involved in a divorce. Somehow, you got to have some sort of relationship here, and there's some sort, but the lawyer is basically going to draw up the terms, and if you violate the terms, you can find yourself in jail. That's the way the kinship covenant thing worked. When they pushed God out, and they wanted to be severed from him, but they still wanted the benefits of having him as their God, God basically brings him the lawyers. It's the law. And the law draws up the terms, and the terms were super detailed. And unless you were a Levite, you did not come before the Lord. The Levites alone could come before the Lord to offer incense to God, to offer sacrifice to God on behalf of the people. And so you just couldn't be, you couldn't even be a king and come before God. You couldn't be a, a, a righteous person for 50 years and come before God. And I think this is the violation. This is the deal. I think Uzziah thought after 50 years of doing it all right, being holy by his own works, by his own righteousness, after five decades of that, it ought to count for something. I should have at least attained to the place where I can come before God. What's Uzziah's sin? He went to church, Bill. Like, what's the big deal with that? He just wanted to worship God. No, Uzziah thought that his 50 years of personally self-righteous doing it all right should count for something in his holy bank. I can be my own priest now. I don't need a mediator. I can be my own priest. I don't need these guys to... 50 years as a king, look how much God has blessed me. Obviously, I now can go and be my own priest. And God's like, no, under this covenant, you cannot. You might say, well, David did it. And you know what? You'd be right. He did. When David brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, David did something with the Ark that was against the law. He didn't put it in the Holy of Holies behind a veil. He basically said to the priest, guys, learn to play your instruments really good because we're going to do 24-7 praise and worship in front of the ark all the time. Not only that, I'm going to come in here and join with you. And sometimes I might dance a little like crazy and I'm going to lose all my dignity and you got to be okay with that. And you know what? God loved that. What's the difference between David and Uzziah? Uzziah thought he was holy enough by his own works to come before God. David knew he wasn't. Uzziah brought the holiness of the fire of the censer of his own self-righteousness before God. David brought all of his unworthiness and says, I'm not even worthy to be here, thank you. He brought a heart of gratitude. Uzziah brought a heart of entitlement. Turn to Isaiah chapter six. I wanna run over to Isaiah six real quick and I wanna show you something. Really interesting here. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 6 is the story of the prophet Isaiah's calling. It's his vision. And it begins with these words, in the year King Uzziah died. Now, why does he even mention that? It has nothing to do with, oh, this is the time frame in which it happened. People say, well, that's just so we know exactly when this happened. No, he mentions it as a prophet because it carries significance. Why does it carry significance for, for, for Isaiah? Because I think Uzziah's death shocked the nation and rocked it to its core. And Isaiah decides he needs to point something out here. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. What's he doing? He knows how Uzziah died. He, he died because he was trying to come before the presence of the Lord and wasn't worthy. And you think about it. If you're a prophet and the king over the nation has spent five decades obeying the law and being the most righteous person in the whole nation, and he can't come before the presence of God, what hope does anybody else have? So Isaiah suddenly goes, uh, something happened the year King Uzziah died. I found myself in the presence of God. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up and exalted. His train filled the temple. 
Above it stood seraphim, verse two, each one with six wings, two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, with two he flew. One cried to another, said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken. The voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, listen to this, verse five, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Now, why did he say this? In the Old Testament, under the law, if you were a leper, you had to go around and proclaim to everybody that you were unclean. But they don't know exactly how leprosy could be passed. So leprosy could be passed through touch, but anything that comes from somebody could possibly pass, you know, pass leprosy, including spit. So this was a masked culture. In other words, when you found that you were leprous, you covered your lips. You covered your mouth. Why? Because if you were spit, talking to somebody, and if you happen to spit on them, maybe it could transmit that leprosy. So you had to holler out, unclean, unclean, with your mouth covered. And so Isaiah goes, in the year King Uzziah died, I had a vision of a holy God. I found myself in the throne. Here's my response, God, I am a leper. I'm a man of unclean lips, that's what it means. So I'm, I'm a leper. Because if Uzziah can't be holy enough to stand before you, what hope do I have? Not only that, but my entire nation is filled with lepers. None of us can keep this law well enough to be holy. Here's what God does. An angel goes down and he grabs a coal off the altar. And he flies down, it says with tongs, right? So it's blazing hot. And he flies down to Isaiah and this is what he does. Touches that fiery coal to what? His lips his mouth, and he says your guilt is gone and your sin has been forgiven. Your iniquity, gone. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, time out. What is God doing here in this moment? He's giving us an important lesson in what was to come in the new covenant, and that is this. You can't make yourself holy with the fire of your own good works. You surrender your wretchedness to God and let the fire of the Holy Spirit come and cleanse the leprosy of your religious effort. What is is Isaiah doing? Nothing, he's just standing there. I'm a leper, God goes, get some fire and put it on his mouth. What What does he do? Nothing, stands there, receives it. Who's doing all the work? God. How's Isaiah get clean? By none of his own effort. He brings all of his, the leprosy of his religion to the Lord. All the leprosy of his good works, his self-righteous pride, whatever goodness he had built up in himself, he brings it all and says, it counts for nothing, God. I can't, I can't be worthy to come before you. And God says, but what if I say you're worthy? And Isaiah, listen, gets in an instant by faith what Uzziah couldn't obtain in 50 years of works. Jump to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. I want to show you something here. I'm just going to show you. So this is where we live now. This is where you and I live. We live in Graceland. <laughs> uh-huh. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, you've come, you've not come to the mountain, this is the mountain of Mount Sinai where the law happened, you've not come to that mountain that may be touched and burned with fire and the blackness and darkness of tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, they couldn't endure what was commanded. So much as a beast touches the mountain, it'll be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses says, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Verse 22, no, you, you're not there. You're not at that mountain. There's, this, is not, this is not a time for an inauguration of a new law of sowing and reaping anymore. This is a whole new world. It says, you have come to Mount Zion. It's verse 22. 
the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all the spirits of the righteous, made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the sprinkle of blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Jump backwards to chapter 8. Chapter 8, in verse 7, the writer of Hebrews is about to record from Jeremiah, and he's going to talk about what Jesus was going to bring. Jeremiah knew it all the way back then. It says, if that first covenant, it's verse 7 of chapter 8, the book of Hebrews, had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. But finding fault with them, this is what he says, Behold, the days are coming. This is what Jeremiah declared, says the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they didn't continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, listen to this, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. You understand how personal that is? This is a pers- this is this is God saying, you know where the Bible is going? It's going to be carved inside of you. My word, the most powerful force in the universe, my very spirit, that is my word, the spirit of the resurrected Christ is actually going to make you his home and not just his home, but the temple for his presence. Turn to the person next to you and say, "You're a temple." Didn't know that, did you? Like, I knew that, but I didn't know that, Bill. I never felt worthy to be a temple where you are because he says you are. Says they'll put put their laws, my laws in their mind and write them on their heart and they will be my God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother, saying to the Lord, know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Look at the unrighteousness in the world around you, and you go, what do I do with that? Jesus says, love your enemies. What is he saying? Mercy is the way that you encounter unrighteousness because the mercy of God triumphs over judgment, and it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. So it's not tolerance of sin. It's a radical compassion that sees past the sin to call out the truth of who God knows that person to be. Says, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. In other words, he completely disarms the power of sin to have a lasting impact or, or any kind of impact or influence on you or anybody around you. That sets captives and prisoners free. Whether you've made choices or others have made choices, there's freedom for you. That's what he wants. He wants you to be free. Verse 13, he says, and he says, a new covenant means he's made the first obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And it would by A.D. 70. Now, God, I'm going to finish this out here. God in Christ brings us, inaugurates us into a new covenant. And this is what he does. He gives us the greatest gift he could give us apart from the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from sin. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit connects you with the heart of God, reveals to you that there's no distance or separation, convinces you of your of your righteousness, it gives you new eyes to see, look around you and see Christ is all and in all, and actually gives you access to the very heart, mind, thought, even let's just say the advice and counsel and wisdom of heaven. And listen, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then prophecy in tongues is actually a gift that comes with the package. It's all included. It's an all-inclusive package. You don't just get to take bits and pieces of it. When you receive the Holy Spirit, he brings the whole truckload with him. Blessed be the Lord, God of our Father, who daily loads us up with benefits. Think of it as like every single day. A big old Amazon truck backs up to your front door. Boom, more benefits, more blessings than you thought. I'll give you just one. 
Let's say that you're encountering a problem and you don't know how to pray for this problem. Well, the Bible says when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're always praying the will of God. Why? Because the Spirit's always praying the will of God and His Spirit makes intercession for us. But where's He doing that from? within you. When you pray in tongues, what's happening? The Holy Spirit is praying. You say, well, I don't understand what he's saying. And that's why we have this beautiful thing called the gift of interpretation. I know probably if those of you filled with the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues, you probably pray in tongues and you feel built up and edified in your spirit. That's great. You know how you can actually access the power of the gift of tongues to solve problems? Because when you Pray in the Holy Spirit over a situation. The Holy Spirit is absolutely praying the solution every single time. So you begin to pray over a situation. Then you ask the Lord to give you a gift of interpretation so you know what you're praying. So you can now come in in your mind into agreement with what your spirit's just been praying. This is how you're transformed by the renewing of the mind so you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Every time you pray in tongues, you're praying the will of God 100% accurate, undiluted. That's why it's so important. You say, well, why does it sound like gibberish? Like, how, have you ever like, have you, oh, in computer language, we all know this. You ever heard of an encrypted message? It means that anybody's trying to hack it or twist it or mess with it or pervert it can't even know what it's saying. When you're praying the will of the Father by the Holy Spirit, the devil is so confused, he has no idea what in the world is going on. Well, that should just make you happy every time you pray in tongues. The devil's just going, God, he's doing that tongues thing again. He's praying, he's releasing the sound of heaven, and we have no idea what he's even saying. And then what do you do? You ask God for a gift of interpretation. You encounter a problem. Try this in your work sometime. You're encountering a problem in your business you don't know how to overcome. Get alone with the Lord. Find somebody who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Pray together in the Holy Spirit, then ask God. Say, God, give us a solution to this problem. We know what concerns us concerns you. And then just begin to pray in tongues. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Then ask God to give you an interpretation for what you've just prayed. And let him just begin to empower your... Funny thing will happen. Suddenly, answers will start coming to you. And you'll think, oh, I should have thought of that before. <laughs> You're not thinking it. Right. You're surrendering your mind to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what the Father has known to be the solution to the problem that you're facing. And boom, all of a sudden, you have, you have a, an answer. I'm like, how did that happen? It's called tongues and interpretation. So you just thought it was for worship, didn't you? The reality is the Holy Spirit knows the answer to every problem. Where do you have access to these gifts? In the new covenant. Why don't we take advantage of what we have access to? Because most of the time we don't feel worthy. Let me tell you, because of what Christ has done, you're worthy. And it's like this. What King Uzziah couldn't get in 50 years of righteous living according to the law because of Jesus, you get instantly for free. Welcome to the new covenant. Oh, it's a good world. It's an amazing, and listen, I think the church 2,000 years after the resurrection, we're just scratching the surface of what Jesus gave us access to in the new covenant. All the healing you'll ever need is in the new covenant. Every answer to every problem you have is in the new covenant. All the solutions, business solutions, are in the new covenant. I was reading yesterday an article. I picked up a leadership magazine in, a, in, a, in, in an airport. I just like leadership stuff. And they say, what do we do? And there's an article. What do we do about, quote, unquote, the great stagnation? The great stagnation, they call it. Because from, like, from 1901 to 1969, in 69 years, human beings went from either walking or riding in horses to landing on the moon. There was an incredible, do you know what also happened in that time? We saw a, a, a re-emergence of the Holy Spirit as people who were, global conflict brought people to a place of seeking God, killed the idol of our certainty, brought people to a place of seeking God, and out of that came the greatest healing revival we've seen in modern history since, since the resurrection. Tents were set up. People like Oral Roberts and various people got up there and said, Jesus can do this stuff. We started idolizing the people and watching ministries topple because that's what happens when we turn them into idols. 
We didn't realize that what they had had tapped into was actually within us. And instead of letting it make us more powerful, we set them up on pedestals and we still consider ourselves lowly, turn them into idols and just watch people end up like coming and going and coming and going. We just say, ah, they just come and go. It was never meant to be that way. People who have these spikes in experience with God were meant to demonstrate to us what authentic kingdom life is like. They're meant to show us the new norm so that the entire body of Christ rises to that revelation. It's not that they became more special than anybody else. They had the exact same Holy Spirit you have. They just learned how to walk in it in a greater degree. That's all. And they were supposed to challenge us to step into that realm. And they did for many people. It spawned a whole lot of stuff. Spawned uh, uh, the, the, the movement in Toronto and Bethel and all these great things that have happened in the world. Incredible, incredible things that have come out where people are just trying things and giving themselves over to saying, God, we know that your power is available for us. We know you want to fill the earth with your glory. Now we're at this place again, but the Bible tells us that knowledge will increase and abound. Where does that happen? I think it's supposed to happen within the people of God. Why? Because the earth is to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The glory of God isn't just to get you into heaven, it's to bring heaven to earth so that all of the solutions, the joy, the righteousness, and the peace of heaven starts flooding the earth through the people of God. So this, this magazine was asking, what's the answer to the great stagnation? I declared it in 2006, 2011, they doubled down on it, and basically said, ever since the iPhone, we've stopped making new stuff. It's like, we're supposed to have flying cars right now, and this is what we got. This is it. This is great. This is fine. But the reality of it is, is there is new stuff to be invented. There's new, there, and what they're waiting, you know what the world is waiting for? Here's the answer to the great stagnation. They're waiting for the next idea that's going to shake the planet. Let's just apply it to the church. There's a great stagnation that's happened in the body of Christ, and we don't know that the new covenant is available to every single one of us. And I feel like in this room, there are more ideas than this region can handle. If you'll allow the Holy Spirit to pray, declare, speak the word of heaven through you, the word of God through you, and grab a hold of an interpretation of that. And you know what? When God reveals to you the dreams that are on his heart and he reveals them to you, you go, I I don't know what to do with this. Hopefully somebody's going to do something with this. When God reveals a dream of his heart to you in the secret place, it's so that you will know that he's made you worthy and equipped you with everything necessary to see that dream fulfilled and to have a hand in its fulfillment. The answer to the energy crisis, the answer to uh, traffic issues, the answer, listen, the answer to all of that stuff is in the kingdom of God. It's true. Some of you in here, you're like, ooh, I, I, I'm kind of feeling like God's calling me to be an inventor again. Yes! There's leadership magazines writing articles that are basically calling to the church going, somebody have a good idea out there? There's got to be more than one Elon Musk in the world, and I think they're actually a part of the kingdom. But when we have a mindset that I'm just here to pay bills and die and hope that God rescues me out and help them, hopefully I'm going to like hold out until the end, that's my testimony. I'm going to hold out until the end. It's not a testimony. That's like an obituary. Come on, seriously. Like... This is not the the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ has answers to everything. (laughs) <laughs> and if the, if the choosing of the disciples to turn the world upside down is any indication, you don't have to take an IQ test to see whether or not you're smart enough to have an idea that'll change the world. When God chooses to move through you by the power of his spirit, he'll ignite within you something that will arise and the whole way, you know, your flesh will be kicking and screaming and going, you're not worthy. Delegate this to somebody else. You can't do this. Somebody else is better to do this than you. There was a lot better people to preach the gospel than the apostle Peter. I promise you that. There was a whole lot better people to handle the treasury of the first ministry team ever than Judas. I promise you that. But God knew what he was doing when he called these people and he gave them a chance and opportunity 
They had an opportunity that they could accept or reject. And I, listen, I feel like under the new covenant, we've been given a whole, whole new world of opportunity to step into a realm beyond what you even could dream, think, or imagine. Because what Uzziah couldn't get in 50 years of doing it right, you have access to because of Christ instantly for free. That's the message of this day. You're in a new covenant world. You have the Holy Spirit within you. Access the gifts and let the gifts start to become practical in your life. And you watch how healing starts popping out. So I want to see the sick healed. Is it God's will to heal? He paid for it on the cross. Can't take it back now. There's no return policy on what he paid for on the cross. It's in the atonement. You say, what do I do if I encounter sickness? Well, you pray for somebody. You just, you know, Peter walks up to this guy. I'm done. Peter walks up to this guy and goes, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give you. Legs. I don't have any money to give you, but I do have legs. You can have the legs. Here you go. And this guy gets up and he's like, do you understand that today, like, you don't know have how much faith that takes? Why was Peter able to say, I can give you legs. I have the confidence that you can walk. Because he'd been walking in that for years. Before the cross, all he had was charisma. Like, after the cross, he had conviction. He knew it was true. He's going to die for this truth. And all he has to do is look at somebody and his shadow heals people. Why? Because mere charisma, walking in power before the cross, turned into conviction, authority after the cross. You learn to walk in power by exercising faith. The more you begin to see God do, that faith increases as authority. You say, well, I've prayed for a thousand people and they haven't gotten healed. What's the problem? Pray for a thousand and one. Every single time you go after invading the impossible, you're one step closer to the breakthrough. That be, what are you doing? You're actually increasing in endurance and perseverance in the promise in spite of the circumstances. Maybe I told you guys this story. We had a young man in Hawaii in our, our ministry school in Hawaii. Man, he wanted to see the sick healed so bad. He wanted to see miracles happen, and we had seen Oh my goodness, hundreds and hundreds of miracles, and we were just so, I, I, we were so overwhelmed. I've seen so much, I can't unsee it. And this guy, he'd go out and he'd pray for people, and he wouldn't get any breakthrough. Everybody around him would see breakthrough, and this guy couldn't get it. He couldn't figure out what was going on, what's the problem? So he went to his pastor, and his pastor belonged to a church that didn't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. And his pastor had a doctorate degree in theology, and this is what his pastor says to him. Well, there is a gift of healing. If you had it, you'd probably see people getting healed. You obviously don't have it since you don't see anybody getting healed. If God wanted you to have it, then you would see results. God obviously doesn't want you to have it because you're not seeing results. So therefore, you should probably stop praying for the sick because you're going against the will of God. I mean, you have, you, honestly, you have to have like a 12-year Bible degree and, and a doctorate to even make that junk up. I mean, it's really a brilliant idea. I just think it's hogwash. But I wasn't going to say that. I, I, I didn't want to dishonor this guy's pastor. And I just said, look, so I, I don't even know what to, to tell you about that. Uh, that's just, that's kind of crazy. Uh, but um, what are you going to do? And this is what this young man says. And he must have prayed for hundreds of people. I'd seen nothing happen. He goes, you know, he's probably right. Maybe I don't have the gift of healing. But I'm going to go ahead and keep praying for people. Because every time I do, I feel like I'm showing heaven what I'd do if I had it. Like, Dad, I promise I'll take care of the car if you let me drive it. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, it's like right after that, this kid became like testimony machine. Breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough. And I began to realize God wasn't withholding healing from this young man because he was being cruel. There was something in his heart that was being developed in perseverance and endurance in the promise in spite of the circumstances and things he wasn't seeing. And when he determined that the circumstances don't matter, I'm fully standing on the faith of the promise, then suddenly the breakthrough began. You say, Bill, I don't even know how to access the things you're talking about today. It seems too good to be true. When you're given to the promise and you're, you're totally sold on the promise of God in spite of the circumstance. Man, I had a good idea in my entire life, Bill. Can it happen to me? Start tapping in the Holy Spirit and see what happens. I got so many problems in front of me, I can't even face it, Bill. What, what are the solutions? The Holy Spirit in you knows the solution to the problem. 
You start tapping into heaven's resource and you'd start watching what happens as the kingdom of God starts to erupt within you, a life that actually turns the world upside down without, or around you. And listen, he, you, he could do it without you, but he wants to use you to do it. He wants to move through you to do it. It's his heart's desire that you and I come into the fullness of the destiny that he's created us for. Why are you here? We're here to worship, to glorify God. But in the midst of this world where there's pain and loss and suffering, God's made you and I the solution. How many times has the answer to a prayer that somebody else prayed come through you? How many times somebody else's answer, you say, well, you know, I felt led to just give to this person. I felt led to bring groceries to this family. And wow, they told me that they were praying for that. And they told me that they were believing for that. I guess God could have answered their prayer, but I, I went ahead and did it. No, you know why you did it? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory, prompted, moved you to do something. Not just because you're an independently nice person. It's because you and God were actually working together at the right moment, at the right time, you did the thing that God asked you to do and you became an answer to somebody else's prayer. Other people have done the same for you. How many times have answers to your prayers come through people? God wants to use you and I in the same way to fill his earth with the glorious revelation that this new covenant is better than we can imagine. Stand with me this morning. Mm. Is your heart encouraged today? Yay. I know mine is. I'm super happy. I just keep preaching until I get extra happy, and then we go to lunch. We have communion. Hey, try this. When you get to lunch, whether you're at home or whatever, have communion. Say, how do I do that? This is what he says. Every time you do this, remember me. What's he saying? Include me at the table. Just include me at the table. Find some way to talk about Jesus at the table today. Somehow, some way. I guarantee it. Don't make this a law. Make it just a goal. Make it a practice that at every meal, you find a way as if Jesus is sitting right there at the table to acknowledge his presence. You know, to turn to him and say, what do you think, Jesus? More than just Jesus blessed this food. Okay? Try to find a way to include him, and then watch what happens. Luke 24, when Jesus is walking with the guys on the road to Emmaus, and he gets to the end, they don't know who he is. They're walking along. They're witnessing to Jesus about Jesus, which is funny. And then Jesus turns and tells, Jesus, tells them all about Jesus, which is just as funny. And to them, it's just a strange guy. They're telling him about Jesus, and he's telling them about Jesus. And man, he knows a lot about Jesus. That's fascinating. <laughs> hey, why don't you come and sit down at a table with us? And Jesus goes, you got it. And so Jesus sits down. At the end of Luke 24, he sits down at a table, and he reaches over, and he grabs some bread, and he breaks it, and he blesses it. And suddenly, they look and go, it's Jesus. <laughs> why? Because it's often at the table of communion that Christ is revealed. And when Christ is revealed, he brings his glory with him and miracles begin to happen. So Lord, we thank you for the revelation of your new covenant. We thank you, God, that Christ in us, the hope of glory, is the answer to every problem the world faces. God, in the days ahead, we're not going to be given over to the religious or political spirit, but Father, we're going to be given over to your Holy Spirit and your Holy Spirit alone. Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would fill up every person today fresh, overflowing with the fire of a new anointing, a new revelation of what they've always contained but never, never walked in. Just put your hand over your heart today and say, Holy Spirit, fill all of me with all of you. Fill me with your fire. Fill me with your oil. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your compassion. And fill me with your joy. Thank you, Jesus, for filling me up with all of you. All right, now take that hand and put it on the shoulder of somebody that's standing next to you and just pray over them. Say, fill them up, Lord. Fill them up, Lord. Fill them up. Fill them up to overflowing from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. May healing oil flow over them right now. Healing oil flow over them right now. The healing oil of the fire of the Holy Spirit flowing over you right now. 
Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in us in our body, soul, and spirit today. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.